Here's an idea. Horse eBooks shows us what the internet's true art form really is. Now, a horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one would tweet at a horse, of course, unless, of course, that horse was selling eBooks. Horse eBooks was a Twitter spam bot. It started out as the project of a mysterious Russian gentleman made to tweet out sentences programmatically generated from a corpus of eBooks about, you guessed it, horses. The tweets were weird, nonsensical, and hilarious, though occasionally they were poetic and even meaningful. Black Fury is the touching story of Chance, a young girl who saw something special in a beautiful black nothing. I am not taught to make any thing. <laughs> learn to forgive yourself, learn to forgive yourself, learn to forgive yourself, learn to forgive yourself. And the people, they flocked. Or herded. Horse was the Twitter spam bot par excellence. It amassed a legion of followers and inspired books, posters, even tattoos. It consistently spewed out what was or seemed like machine assembled poetry. Horse was, in short, and maybe a little melodramatically, the soul in the machine. And it had been spammy business as usual for over three years when on September 24th, 2013, in concert with the conclusion of an ominous countdown on the YouTube channel Pronunciation Book, we learned that what we thought was randomly generated, mysteriously maintained, and accidentally meaningful spam was in fact the human authored and purposeful work of a person. A person who works at BuzzFeed, no less. And people, I amongst them, were pissed. And that is what we're gonna talk about. Why the love for horse, why the anger, and why it matters. But first, in order to talk about horse, we have to talk about spam. And in order to talk about spam, we have to talk about the attention economy. So I think we can all agree that there is a lot happening on the internet. There's a lot to look at and watch and listen to, and lots of people who want you to look at and watch and listen to their things. Yet there are only so many hours in one day for you to look at things, and you want to look at only, or mostly, things that you like. These are the features that define the internet's attention economy. How, where, and why people on the internet spend their attention. We've done a good amount of work to quantify the attention economy through the tabulation and display of things like fave stars, likes, notes, reblogs, retweets, upvotes, views, and so on. A higher number of which suggests that this thing is worth your attention, you should look at it. But we've also figured out how to game the attention economy. Sexy thumbnails, misleadingly labeled links, clickbaity headlines, in-stream advertising, and repost after repost after repost, all getting you to pay attention to something that you wouldn't have otherwise. In his book Spam, Finn Brunton defines it succinctly as the use of information technology infrastructure to exploit pre-existing aggregations of human attention. Clogging up YouTube comment streams, constantly adding you on Twitter in your email inbox, these things are distracting and irritating. But not horse ebooks, Horse never at reply to people, rarely posted links, and just went about its job generating these weird chunks of text. It was Spam's normal relationship to the attention economy reversed. It was not asking, we were choosing to pay attention because it was entertaining and non-threatening, almost pet-like. It was domesticated Spam. It was a precious and precocious little bot accidentally, it seemed, being creative and insightful. Horse's text was created using a technique called Markov chains, which when applied to a body of text creates a semi-coherent jumble of the source. A Markov transition of the text of this very episode, for instance, generates the sentence, but to consider it earnestly, the soul of the distant past, Mr. Andy Bayo, said that the internet's native art form really is a horse. Brunton describes this kind of spam as lit spam. A Joycean gesture, he writes, with flashes of lucidity in the midst of a fugue state, like disparate strips of film haphazardly spliced together. Lit spam hopes to trick spam filters into thinking that it is textual communication actually typed out by a human. But it also triggers our predilection for finding meaning where it is not purposefully created, which at Horse's beginning, it wasn't, but it certainly got us to pay attention. Then, around September 2011, Horse started updating from the web and not the API, a signal of a transition from its originally programmatically generated and posted text to text written and tweeted by human hands. Then, pronunciation books started to count down, and at the end of that countdown, it was Susan Orlean who broke the news. She wrote that the creators of the two accounts will prove that they are indeed human in a performance that is the final flourish in this suite of conceptual art pieces, weaving together both horse ebooks and pronunciation book. As it turns out, since 2011, Horse had been a person performing as a spam bot, and it certainly did end with a flourish of advertising. Not for horses or ebooks, but for another art piece made in conjunction with the creator of Pronunciation Book. The internet had been, in a word, 
Horst. Outrage was in no short supply. This thing that people had adopted, in a sense, turned into something else, the opposite of itself, but also, weirdly, exactly what it was. When Horse ebooks was ineffectual spam, it was beloved, but when it turned into incredibly effective spam, reviled. In reference to Horse ebooks, Dan Sinker even wrote, never love anything you meet on the internet ever again. Now, at some point in the not-too-distant past, blogger extraordinaire, former Kickstarter CTO, and all-around neat guy Andy Bayo said that the internet's native art form is the animated gif, or jife. And up until this whole thing, I have totally agreed with him. Heck, I even recently wrote a book chapter premised on that very idea. But in the wake of horse ebooks, I'm starting to think that, whatever it might mean, the internet's native art form might be spam. It is created by, on, and for the internet. It expresses and inspires a whole gamut of emotions. It is constantly changing, always surprising, and unlike the GIF, it has been around as long as the internet, longer even. It is purpose-built to grab your attention. It requires skill and planning to execute, and it inarguably has an audience. There is good spam, bad spam, and everything in between. Now, I know that it's easy to laugh at a group of people who are upset because they found out a fake horse is fake in a way that's different from the way that they thought it was fake. But to consider it earnestly, it also illustrates how important it was to so many people that the machine have a soul or a something. Because if it does, that means that the machine is something separate from us, and it becomes a little bit easier to believe that not every single thing you do online is measured or tracked or serving some corporate purpose, which it is. Through horse ebooks, we were searching for an artful internet. And maybe we found it, but the art is either machine-generated nonsense or some dude trying to sell us something. Or both. Either way, it's spam. What do you guys think? Is spam the internet's native art form? Let us know in the comments. And you can subscribe to Idea Channel confident in the knowledge that I am and always have been a spam bot. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Also fair to ask would be whether or not you can simply enjoy Idea Channel. I think the answer is yes. Let's see what you guys had to say about the enjoyment of Breaking Bad. Eugene Conniff says that you absolutely can read into the wire, and I totally agree. The thing that I was trying to say is that Breaking Bad sort of encourages a kind of theorizing that the wire doesn't, like you can't really spoil the wire, at least not in the same way that you can with Breaking Bad. It doesn't have, like we were talking about, secrets, and I think that that is the big difference. It's true, Mr. Haggai, I, it took me, I think, five tries to watch through the entirety of Breaking Bad. I ended up watching it because I felt like I had to, and I'm very glad I did. It wasn't easy. I watched it over the course of maybe three weeks, but... Wobble Wobble makes a really interesting point connecting the difficulty of Breaking Bad with the gaming industry and saying that fun and entertaining are two different things that can be separated and that you might sacrifice some quality in making something that is simply fun because maybe it'll lack some depth in the end. This is a really great, really good comment. Emily from Blink Pop Shift characterizes the enjoyment that you get from Breaking Bad as very complex and talks about extreme emotional tourism, which is an idea that I love and I think says exactly what goes on. You watch those characters go through all of this stuff and it's, yeah, it's enjoyable. Oh man, Bart's teacher's name is Krabappel? I've been calling her Crabapple. I've been making a fool of myself. No, but really. Thank you for telling me that it's pronounced Michelle Hanuki. Hanuki. To Mike Harlem, you are factually correct. That is the best compliment that you can give us. Thank you. Jacob McCann and Wasid Rayuti seem to agree that something cannot just be difficult. It cannot simply be a hard piece of media, that there has to be some structural element of it that draws you in and that that is what makes a truly great difficult work and I totally agree. Comments left by Jason Eckenroth and a couple other people convinced me that I don't think that we will do a Big Bang Theory episode. I really like celebrating things and being excited about stuff, and I kind of don't want to complain for six minutes. Also, there was recently a piece on the AV Club about Homestar Runner and how it was a show that was very positive and brimming with positivity, and that's what made it really fun, and that, yeah, I like that. I like that, so no complaining. I'll just make fun of it every once in a while. To Troy McClure 2002 and everyone else complaining about my pronunciation of Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad. This is probably a regional thing, like insurance, insurance, and Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. I'm sorry, I guess. This week's episode is brought to you by the hard work of these spam bots. We have an IRC and a subreddit, links in the description. We won a mashy, and the tweet of the week is from Kid Techno, who asks whether or not it's possible that Courage the Cowardly Dog takes place in Night Vale. I'm gonna say yeah.